specificity or to improve the utility of enzymes in diagnosis. And then I will mention a few uh, enzyme patterns. Uh, we, we had already uh, discussed some enzyme patterns when we discussed uh, liver function, evaluation of liver function. Okay. So just uh, to remind ourselves that uh, enzymes are proteins. Yeah, you never forget that enzymes are proteins and that they are proteins which have uh, catalytic activity. So they are uh, used for that purpose. And uh, the, the catalytic activity means that they would alter and usually it is to accelerate the, the rate of reaction. And uh, through this function, enzymes then regulate metabolic reactions. And it is this uh, activity of regulation which then uh, uh, gives way to inherited disorders when that regulatory action is not available, if enzymes are missing, then you have what are known as uh, inherited metabolic disorders. And uh, importantly is that enzymes are very specific in their activity. Yeah, I'm just reminding ourselves about the biochemistry of, of enzymes. Yeah, and I just, uh, uh, again, to take us back to biochemistry, that uh, enzymes are usually grouped into about five groups. We have uh, what are known as oxidoreductases, then transferases, hydrolases. This is to complete uh, your, your, your biochemistry, just to remind you that biochemistry shouldn't be lost. Hydrolases, lyases, isomerases, and ligases. Yeah. So when, uh, when, when, when you're reading about specific enzymes, uh, please remember their, their biochemistry. Yeah, that is, that is just to remind us of that. And then uh, we also have what are known as isoenzymes. Now isoenzymes, these are enzymes, they have the same catalytic activity. So they perform the same biological function. However, they do differ in some of their physical chemical properties. Yeah. And so these differences in physical chemical properties have been uh, uh, exploited and identified through their things like uh, how they, 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 they move when the protein is uh, subjected to charge, that is electrophoresis. When electrophoresis is done, some uh, isoenzymes would have different electrophoretic mobility. Some would, uh, would they have different solubilities. Some of the isoenzymes would get inactivated by different substances. And uh, some of their specific cat catalytic characteristics may differ from one isoenzyme to another. And uh, these isoenzymes may have different tissues of origin. And it is this uh, variation in the tissues of origin which has uh, uh, made isoenzymes to have some uh, diagnostic utility. So that if you find a specific isoenzyme in uh, serum, then uh, you can postulate that it is coming from a specific tissue because of these uh, uh, known differences in the physical chemical properties of isoenzyme. And uh, we will mention uh, just the one of two. Then uh, just to ensure that uh, we don't confuse isoenzymes with the cofactors, again, going back to your biochemistry, you know that uh, uh, cofactors of enzymes, these are the non-protein a moiety of an enzyme. They are, however, necessary for the enzyme to become activated. So I, cofactors are needed for activation of enzyme. And they can be grouped into two. They may be organic cofactors and they can be inorganic. Yeah. So if the cofactor is, is organic, it is also referred to as a coenzyme. Yeah, and then you also have uh, inorganic cofactors like uh, this one's NAD, sorry, so inorganic zinc, 
zinc, which is found in uh, alcohol, dehydrogenase, is uh, inorganic. The iron that is found in the cytochrome system, the magnesium, which is found in most kinases. And then you have, of course, the, the coenzymes, the usual ones, the acetyl-CoA, NADP, NAD. Yeah, all those are coenzymes. Yeah. So this, this is, uh, I'm mentioning this so that we don't confuse coenzymes or cofactors with isoenzymes. So we don't utilize, we don't utilize the uh, cofactors in diagnostic enzymology, but uh, we utilize uh, isoenzymes in diagnostic enzymology. Okay, so what do we use enzymes for in uh, clinical medicine? We know that uh, I already mentioned that if enzymes are deficient or uh, in either quantity or quality, then they can cause disease. Yeah, and uh, this is where the the, the this is the realm of inherited metabolic disorders, which are very many. And uh, you, we discussed them last year when you are in third year, the inherited metabolic disorder. Then the enzymes are also used a lot in, uh, in, in, in medicine as diagnostic tools, which is what we are discussing this morning. And uh, we also know that enzymes are reagents. Yeah, because of their catalytic activity. They are used for many, many uh, biochemistry, hematology uh, 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 analysis. Uh, enzymes are part of the, of the analytical, uh, of the reagents that are used in, in most of those analyses. And then uh, of course, uh, uh, a lot of work has, has been done so that enzymes can also be used as therapeutic agents especially in situations where the enzymes are lacking. Yeah. But our task this morning for the next few minutes will just to in the use of enzymes for diagnosis. Yeah. So like I said, diagnostic enzymology, this is where we are using enzymes for evaluating disease. The enzyme itself is not a cause of pathology. It is just the innocent, it is a consequence the enzyme uh, uh, increase is a consequence of pathology, not a cause of pathology, yeah? So we therefore use the uh, enzymes in, uh, in, in assessing cell damage. And uh, because of knowledge of uh, location of certain enzymes, we can uh, use enzymes to try and localize where the damage is. And uh, once, uh, we identify an elevation of an enzyme, then we can use, we can do serial analysis of the enzyme to monitor recovery or the progression of disease. Yeah, so they can be used for diagnosis. And if a diagnosis is made, then you can also use it to monitor the, the progression of the disease state. So what is the, most of the enzymes we are interested in, certainly in chemistry, are located in serum. So serum enzymes have uh, two origins, two main origins. There are some enzymes which are actually found in plasma. Yeah, these are uh, plasma, plasma specific. And uh, these, uh, 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 like most proteins, they are mostly synthesized in the liver. And so they carry out their activity, their catalytic activity takes place in plasma. And I've given examples there. We know that uh, lipoprotein lipase, you know, the, the in, in lipid metabolism, it uh, uh, confers its action when the lipids are moving in plasma. Then uh, we have thrombin, we have plasmin. These are uh, the coagulation uh, in the coagulation uh, system their activity takes place in plasma. Yeah, in fact, most of the plasma specific um, enzymes are involved in the coagulation pathway. That is, that is where they play the main role. And then we have enzymes which are found in cells. So they are non plasma specific. Yeah, meaning that they would be found 
in, uh, in, in serum or plasma at a relatively low concentration, but I would, their concentration would only increase if there is cell damage so that they get released from, their, from the, the cells where they predominate. And uh, it is uh, this release of the enzymes into serum that then we find to have diagnostic utility. So that if the enzyme is raised, we know there must be some cells which are damaged. And then knowing the location of a certain enzyme, then we can identify that this is, it is this tissue which is likely to be, to be damaged. And that is what diagnostic enzyme, <coughs> enzymology is all about. Yeah. So once enzymes are released in, uh, in, in plasma, or in, yeah, in plasma from damaged cells, they, they get cleared. However, how they get cleared, the mechanism is not uh, fully elucidated. It is thought that some of them are uh, maybe broken down in plasma itself. Some can be cleared through the kidneys, the one which has been uh, most well studied uh, to, with regard to its renal clearance is amylase because it is a small protein. It has a low molecular weight. So we find that uh, amylase is uh, 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 readily excreted through the kidney. And we can even measure now urinary amylase. And in the old days, urinary amylase was used for diagnosis of as a, as a, uh, in diagnostic enzymology. Yeah, but what is known with regard to their clearance is that it occurs at different rates. So when a cell is damaged and it releases its full complement of enzymes into the plasma, different enzymes will be cleared at different rates. And uh, this uh, 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 varied clearance also has found some diagnostic utility, yeah? Like uh, when, uh, when you compare uh, the release of uh, the clearance of creatine kinase versus lactate dehydrogenase, you find that lactate dehydrogenase is slightly bigger molecule. It, uh, it is, uh, the clearance is much slower. So elevations would be uh, seen for a much longer period than uh, uh, those which are rapidly cleared. Now, the, the downside of enzymes is that uh, most enzymes are not tissue or organ specific, which is not unexpected because uh, most cells would have the full complement of the genome. So the capability of, 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 um, of uh, uh, elaborating the enzymes is, is there in most cells. It is slight differentiation, you know, what, what provides uh, a tissue differentiation, it may be there, but most of the enzymes that we are concerned with are enzymes which are normally used in metabolism. So they would be found in most, uh, in most tissues. Yeah. So that uh, lack of organ or tissue specificity limits the utility of enzymes. Yeah. And then we, of course, we also have uh, a non-specific elevation which can be due to, some can be due, some can be predictable with regard to physiological factors. Like uh, we know that uh, the function of alkaline phosphatase is, uh, is, is uh, when there is, uh, it supports osteoblast osteoblastic activity. And therefore, when there is a growth, alkaline phosphatase is going to be raised. So we find higher, concentrations of alkaline phosphatase in, uh, in, 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 in plasma during, when the, in the younger population, in children, let me just say in children, and during the adolescent period than in the adults. So that is physiological. And uh, we also have gender differences, gender differences, uh, and like with regard to creatine kinase, it is the gender difference with creatine kinase it is not, uh, it is mainly because of a higher muscle bulk. 
creatine kinase is uh, mainly found in muscle. So those who have a higher muscle bulk would have higher levels of CK. And that is why we find it uh, a little bit higher in males compared to females because they tend to have a higher muscle bulk. Yeah. Then uh, also pregnancy. Pregnancy, you would find uh, high levels of alkaline phosphatase. And this is because of the fetal uh, uh, laying down of bone, the growth in the, in the fetus, particularly in the second and third trimester. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, when, uh, when there is uh, exercise, especially those who undertake a lot of exercise, you know, those uh, muscle building, the muscle building exercises can uh, raise CK significantly that uh, you can even think that there is a pathology. Those who do those uh, muscle building, especially if they eat those uh, the creatine, I don't know what they call those diets with, uh, with high levels of creatine, then uh, the uh, creatine kinase can uh, increase significantly. Yeah. So these are the things to, to appreciate so that when you are using, uh, when you are looking at enzymes, in a, for diagnosis, you have to take those considerations. Yeah. Then now we have enzymes which can be induced, induced by drugs, uh, 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 particularly, uh, particularly gamma glutamate transferase is, uh, is notorious for this. And uh, the drugs which are known to induce many enzymes, to induce enzymes include the anticonvulsants like phenytoin, barbiturates. We, we know very well with, about alcohol and the induction of, uh, of uh, gamma GT as well as alkaline phosphatase. Yeah. And the, the, the other factor is uh, uh, hemolysis. Yeah, so when there is hemolysis, then of course you're going to get a release of the red cell, red cell enzymes, which then can cause uh, a pre-analytic uh, elevation of enzymes, particularly aspartate transaminase and uh, LDH, which are rich, found in high concentrations in, in, in red cells. And uh, so for, because of these, uh, this pre-analytic factor, usually for enzyme analysis, we prefer that you use a fresh sample and the serum is preferred to plasma uh, because uh, some of the anticoagulants can also inhibit some of the enzymes that uh, one would be interested in measuring. So the preferred specimen type is serum and the sample should be fresh, serum separated as early as possible so that you don't get hemolysis or leakage of enzymes from, from red cells because the blood has been left standing for long. Yeah. And the, 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 the hemolysis, if, even if there is a intravascular hemolysis, you would get this same uh, pattern, you know, raising of AST and, and LDH. So patients with malaria and other hemolytic conditions, you would get this elevation of AST. Yeah. So I mentioned the, the limitation is the non-specificity of the, of the enzymes that they're found in many, in many tissues. And then of course, the enzymes just indicate that there is cell damage. They don't indicate the cause of the pathology. Yeah. They don't indicate that, oh, this is due to burns, this is due to drugs, or this is due to, to a tumor. It just says that this enzyme is raised and uh, so you look for the pathology. You, 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 you put in the other clinical, clinical factors to identify the pathology. Yeah. So there are uh, some approaches which uh, have been uh, used and are still being used to improve the specificity of uh, in diagnostic enzymology. One is uh, to do serial enzyme estimation. Serial enzyme estimation helps because of the timing. Remember we said that enzymes are released and then they are cleared at different rates. So when, you, when the patient presents themselves, you don't know where in the continuum of their disease process they have come. So you may, if you only do one analysis and uh, perhaps it is too early for that enzyme to have been significantly raised, you may get a false negative. Yeah. 
So if the clinical picture is highly suggestive of pathology, then uh, you would want to repeat and uh, see whether you are getting an elevation in the enzyme. Yeah, so serial enzyme estimations are useful to avoid false negatives. Then isoenzyme determination helps in uh, improving specificity of tissue location. And this is mainly for enzymes where we know that uh, this a certain isoenzyme predominates in a certain tissue as opposed to uh, a, a different isoenzyme. And that uh, this has been exploited mostly with the cardiac in, in, in acute myocardial infarction. And I will just remind ourselves, I think we must have discussed it, but I will remind ourselves of that again. Yeah, so isoenzyme determination. And then we also use panels. Multiple enzyme estimation improves in the sensitivity and specificity. Rarely do we just measure one enzyme, yeah, because you know, then you may it, it may just be an in a haystack, but when you use panels that improves the specificity of, of, of uh, diagnosis of a particular condition. Okay, then uh, there is this other aspect of uh, analytical enzymology. Oops, where am I? Yeah. Analytical enzymology, remember enzymes are proteins which have catalytic activity. So we, in the lab, we can measure the enzyme using its catalytic activity. And you find that most enzyme assays are based on this catalytic activity of the enzyme. And that is why you will find most enzyme results are reported as units, you know, units per liter. We rarely use catal. But uh, most enzymes you find, if you see units per liter, you know that it was analyzed using its catalytic property. But uh, some, some assays use the protein property. And when it is now measured as a protein, it is measured with the same quantities that you measure protein. So if you say, if you find micrograms per, per, per DL or per liter, you know that this is now a protein. It is not the analysis was not anchored on the catalytic property of the enzyme, but that the enzyme is a protein. And uh, when it is measured as a protein, then uh, the assay method has to be very sensitive because the quantities are low, so you'd find that in you know, assay method. So why am I mentioning this? Uh, because in, uh, uh, it, this has uh, mostly been exploited with regard to, to CKMB, CKMB in diagnosis of myocardial infarction. And why, why measure it as a protein? Because uh, it, you know when you're looking at the catalytic activity, I've mentioned that there are pre-analytic factors which can affect it. Especially like when the, an anticoagulant has been used, it can inhibit the enzyme. So you may get falsely low uh, 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 results or something else may inhibit the enzyme in the course of analysis. However, the protein is always there. So there is a greater, there is a greater sensitivity when it is measured as a protein as compared to when you're measuring it as, a, as an enzyme. Yeah. So the, the, uh, which, which uh, conditions have diagnostic enzymology found most utility? muscle disorders, uh, pancreatitis, bone disorders, liver. Just to mention a few, these are the ones I will cover to, which, yeah, these are the ones I will mention. I don't know what, why, okay. I don't know what I have done. Hello, can you hear me? Han, can you hear me? Yes, Professor, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So in start with muscle, now we, we have what we refer to you know, as a muscle enzyme, muscle enzyme panel. And at this panel, when, when, uh, when a request is made for muscle enzyme panel, then uh, the, the panel is comprised of creatine kinase, uh, aspartate transaminase, and lactate dehydrogenase, and the aldolase may also be added. 
I'm saying aldolase may also be added because it is not a, a routinely available assay. Yes, yeah, so some labs may include aldolase uh, 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 if the assay is available. Otherwise, uh, the ones which don't have the triad will be CKAST and LDH. And remember this uh, panel, CKAST and LDH, is also the panel which was known as the cardiac. Recording in progress. Professor. Professor. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Oops. Hello? Can you hear me? I don't know what is happening. Can Hello? you hear me? Can you... Yes, Professor. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It seemed like I got muted. Can you hear me now? Wow. Uh, it seems like I got muted. My internet went off a bit and I got muted. So can I go on? Yes, you can uh, begin the presentation again, sharing. Oh, oh, okay. Oh dear, all right. Okay, you lost everything. Oh, I also lost my internet. So. Oh. Now, how do I, hmm, okay. 
Eleni Can you see? Yes, Are you able to I can see. see. Okay. Yes. So let me go to where I think I had uh, when we lost contact. I think it was here. Yes. I was mentioning the, the distribution of CK in the various tissues. Recording in progress. Okay. Yeah. So the the utility of uh, uh, muscle enzyme analysis is mainly between the <coughs> cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. Yeah. So the, we are mainly interested in CK, either CKMB or CKMM when uh, we are considering my muscle enzyme, when a request is made for muscle enzyme panel, either it's a skeletal muscle condition or, uh, or a cardiac muscle condition. Yeah. So when we have elevation of uh, CKMM, yeah, then uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main clinical condition that uh, gives the highest differential is rhabdomyolysis. And I uh, would get uh, elevation of CKMM when there are crash injuries, particularly in uh, a road traffic accident. When, the road tra when somebody is involved in a road traffic accident with the multiple um, limb injuries, then uh, we know there will be significant rhabdomyolysis. And then, of course, we also have uh, uh, necrotizing polymyopathies, where especially the auto autoimmune. Uh, immune type, which can cause significant destruction of uh, skeletal muscle, occasionally drugs or infection. So you have uh, a CK elevation, which can be up to 200 times the upper reference limit. Yeah, and that the concern, particularly with the, with the crash injuries, is as there is a destruction of muscle, there is also release of myoglobin. And that the myo, so the myoglobin can uh, cause acute kidney injury, myoglobin induced nephropathy. So that uh, you know we want to avoid uh, AKI due to myoglobin because it has a, it has a significant uh, uh, mobility and mortality associated with it. So when there is a max CK elevation, you always want to look for myoglobin. To exclude, to ensure that uh, there will be no ensuing myoglobin induced AKI. We allude to it by measuring CKMB. Yeah, so that uh, if uh, we have a, a raised total CK and the CKMB fraction is, uh, is, is uh, not is a minimal, then we know that uh, most of the uh, circulating CK is a, is a MM, isoenzyme, yeah. So the other causes of uh, raised CK is, uh, are things like poliomyelitis and other viral myelitis. But the main thing would be in a uh, significant elevation is rhabdomyolysis, yeah. The other uh, situation where CK is of concern is when we have the muscular dystrophies and uh, particularly the sex linked type, which is the Duchenne, uh, Duchenne uh, 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 sex linked muscular dystrophy, where CK activity is, uh, is, is uh, raised when there is in the phase of muscle destruction. Yeah. And it may be up to 50 times the upper reference limit. The, the, the progression of the disease is a commensurate with the, with the CK levels. So you have the levels highest in infancy and childhood where there is maximal destruction of enzyme, of, sorry, of muscle. 
and then uh, and, and the CK elevation would precede the clinical manifestation of, of muscle wasting. Yes, yeah, so it, it, would, it would come even before there would be sub, subclinical elevation of CK prior to the overt manifestation of disease. And uh, when a CK is measured serially as the disease is progressing, then the CK reduces with the disease progression. And uh, this is uh, a poor prognostic feature because it indicates that uh, the, the muscles which can now release CK are, be are becoming fewer. So you are having now a reduction in the functioning muscle. And uh, in, in the early, you know, in uh, early years, this reduction would sometimes be used to determine when a patient now would need ventilatory support. When you have total destruction of muscles, including the respiratory musculature. So the patient then uh, you know, monitoring would indicate, would uh, inform the timing of, uh, of uh, now uh, 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 providing ventilatory support to the patients. Yeah. Now with the CK was also used in a carrier for carrier detection. Yeah, because with the with the sex link, it means the females are the carriers. And uh, the so when an index case has been identified, has been diagnosed, then the female relatives would be would be screened and they would be found to have a, a slight elevation of CK. And so that one would identify who are the carriers and the counseling, genetic counseling could be provided. Yeah. But now with the, with the uh, more accurate molecular techniques, now Duchenne is now mostly diagnosed from uh, genetic uh, screening using PCR based. We go straight to the gene. Then uh, with the acute myocardial infarction, this is uh, what you're familiar with. The triad the CKMB, ST, and LDH. And uh, here we also use uh, the timing, the rise and fall pattern with the different timings for the, for the enzymes. Yeah, so that uh, CK and CKMB rise early and LDH rises late and remains high for longer. Yeah, so what I said with regard to the timing and uh, uh, if if uh, if the if a patient comes to A and E, and let's say uh, and um, say a facility doesn't have troponin, we don't assume that all facilities in Kenya would have now troponin. If that is not that would not be accurate. Yeah. So if there is no troponin, we know that the recommended uh, second best uh, marker for AMI is CKMB. Yeah. So if a patient comes to the A and E with a suggestive history and that the CKMB is measured and it is found to be normal, then uh, the consideration of a very early presentation would be entertained and a repeat would be done within about four to six hours so that you're looking for the rise. So a, a diagnosis is not excluded on the basis of only one negative result. Yeah, that is what I said about uh, uh, timing of the specimen collection. Yeah, and uh, because we are using, and then the, the utility of the panel is that uh, depending on uh, knowledge of, again, the rise and fall pattern, if CKMB is raised and LDH is normal, then uh, we would make an impression of an early presenting AMI. If, however, LDH is raised and CKMB is normal, then uh, we can make an impression of a late presenting AMI because we know that uh, uh, late presenting meaning the patient is coming perhaps uh, five to seven days after the, 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 the infection episode. Yeah. So the panel can help with regard to, to timing of, the, of when the damage occurred and so that you don't make a false, a false negative, again, a false negative diagnosis. 
Okay. Now, even in centers where, where troponin is available, there's still some cardiologists who would still measure CKMB. And uh, the reason for that is uh, being an early marker, uh, they sometimes, not they sometimes, those who still use CKMB would use it to detect infarct extension. Yeah, infarct extension or reinfarction. A patient with, with an AMI may get a reinfarction even while they're in the facility, even under, under care. Or the infarct may extend beyond, you know, the, the, the size where the patient presented in. And what would be found is you'd get a second peak in the CKMB, that it had risen, it was now dropping, and then it starts rising again. Yes, so when there is a second peak, then it tells the, it tells us that something else, a new episode, you know, a new release is occurring. And most likely it is either the infarct has extended or there is a new infarct riding on the old infarct. Yeah, so that is a, a, a muscle. Then we have the enzymes which are used in bone disease. And here it's alkaline phosphatase alkaline phosphatase, and it is present in all those tissues, and they say it reflects osteoblastic activity. <laughs> now, causes of uh, elevation in alkaline phosphatase include Paget's disease of bone, where you get very high uh, levels. I haven't seen Paget's disease yet, yeah, but it is, uh, it, it is there, uh, the orthopedic uh, surgeons mention it, yeah. Most uh, often you will find alkaline phosphatase in the uh, usual rickets and osteomalacia, rickets in children, and uh, if it occurs in adults, it is osteomalacia. And uh, it would, uh, it would uh, tally with the vitamin D, especially when they know there is low vitamin D, you, you know, and low hypocalcemia, low vitamin D, that, and alkaline phosphatase elevation, a diagnosis of rickets is, is very straightforward. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, when there is hyperparathyroidism as well, and uh, in, osteo, in osteosarcoma or other bone lesions. Now, remember, alkaline phosphatase is also found, is part of the liver function test profile. Yeah. So the, the reason why there is gamma GT in an LFT profile is to provide a differential between alkaline phosphatase coming from bone and alkaline phosphatase coming from the liver. So we usually say that if, if a gamma GT is normal and ALP is raised, or what we call an isolated ALP elevation, it is from bone. If both of them are elevated, then it is, it, it is from the liver, yeah? So in this case, uh, uh, while I catch my breath, the 16-year-old male, who would like to uh, indicate what is, what is the cause of the LP elevation in this 16-year-old? Um, Pam, can you select somebody to just tell us what, 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 what why is the LP raised in this 16-year-old? Uh, Lavin Ogada. Pardon? Somebody can write on the chat and you can, I don't know if I can see the chat. Why is the LP raised? Why is the LP raised? Am I still being heard? Hello, am I being heard? Or am I talking to myself? Um, Am I able to see this thing? Uh, okay, bone disorder, bone disorder, bone disease. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So unfortunately, so if this 16 year old landed in uh, the hands of the, of, of the people who are writing on the chat, he would now be subjected to a lot of analysis. Eh? This is what I mentioned, physiological elevation. 16-year-old adolescent growth spurt, 
you know, that one you, I would just report this is physiological unless proven otherwise. So this is what you get. That is what they say that uh, they know the sum of the physiological causes of, of, of uh, enzyme elevation. Yeah, so this is, hello? Yeah, am I still being heard? Yes, Professor. Okay, thank you. Then the 70 year old that is straightforward, that is metastatic cancer in both. You're having isolated CK, uh, ALP elevation, that magnitude with the PSA of uh, 800. That's what they just tell the clinician to look for, for tumor in both. Is, 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 is that, is that uh, straightforward? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Where am I now? Where am I stuck? Uh, mm. okay. Yeah, so then the other, uh, now you have to move a bit faster. Uh, acute pancreatitis is the other condition where enzymes have been uh, widely used. And the enzyme, first of all, it was amylase. Amylase uh, was used for a very long time. However, amylase is not very specific because uh, there are several causes of, you know, acute pancreatitis presents as an acute abdomen. And there are a number of acute abdominal conditions where there is hyperamylasemia, like uh, in uh, when there is uh, a perforated duodenal ulcer, cholecystitis, intestinal obstruction, which are part of the differential diagnosis for acute pancreatitis, yeah? Including severe DKA can present as an acute abdomen, yeah? And then uh, severe glomerular dysfunction, here it is because, remember I mentioned amylase is excreted in urine. So if there is a glomerular failure, then you get retention. So that non-specificity of amylase is a drawback. However, we say that uh, the higher the, the amylase, the more likely that you're dealing with acute pancreatitis, yeah. So once uh, amylase is released it, in acute pancreatitis, it starts rising early and uh, usually it's normal by about three days, usually depending on the progression of the disease condition. So to improve on the specificity, that is why lipase was added, yeah. So whenever if a, a clinician only requests for amylase, and we find that it is raised, you always remind them to, to, to request for lipase to improve the specificity of pancreatitis detection. Yeah. So like you can see they are deep and they have different rise and fall patterns. We can see for this uh, 48 year old female where both uh, amylase and lipase were, were raised on admission. And uh, you can see the, the progression and there was a steep peak in, uh, in uh, amylase on, on day three. That is why you have two estimations on day three. And then with the, with the, with the, uh, with the effective intervention, you can see that there is a significant drop in the, in, in, in the enzyme. So once, a, once a, a diagnosis is made, then serial estimations are usually done until the until the enzyme normalizes, yeah, which would indicate that now what had been released has been cleared and there is no additional release of, 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 of enzyme from damaged tissue. Yeah. Then the uh, lactate dehydrogenase, uh, um, it's a tetrama. So you have five isoenzymes, they are referred to as LD1 to LD5. Yeah, and uh, those who like uh, permutations can uh, look at those permutations. If you have a tetrama of two different, uh, two, two, two different chains, these are the various permutations. Yeah, but uh, importantly is the utility of the, of the isoenzymes. LD1 is also referred to, um, it's also referred to which dehydrogenase, I forget, um, hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase. It is the one which is uh, used in AMI diagnosis. And then when you have a skeletal muscle diseases, it is LD5 and then LD, 
LD1, LD4, and LD5 are known to be raised in tumors. At the KNH, we mainly use LDH for, for tumors, particularly hematological malignancies. Yeah, hematological malignancies. Yeah. So, like uh, this uh, 33 year old. Yeah, where the clinical, the, the, the requisition indicated, you know, a hepatosplenomegaly query codes. And we found that LDH is about four times the upper reference limit with the, with the minimal elevation in bilirubin. So you know that uh, this is mainly splenomegaly, which is the predominant than, than hepatomegaly. Yeah, so these are hematological uh, malignancies uh, LDH elevation is quite prevalent among the patients that we see. Yeah, and I think that is the last slide. So this last slide is to remind us that we had already discussed enzymology with regard to hepatic disease. Yeah, so if somebody can, uh, can uh, tell me for the 30 year old man, for the 30 year old man, what is, what is the diagnosis? Spot diagnosis. These are the these are the kind of things that we like bringing in the spot. The thirty year old male. That is the first one. Any takes on it? It doesn't get uh, better than this. Spot. You know, when you give in the spot, you say, "What is the likely diagnosis?" and then recommend one test, one additional test. Anybody, anybody uh, Han, is there anybody giving us a, an impression? Or I leave you to go home with them? Am I still being heard? Am I still being heard? Yes, Professor. Someone is uh, saying liver disease. Liver, what liver disease? You know, liver hepatitis. Has yeah, this is a, yeah, this is most likely acute hepatitis. If you this is 30 year old, you just say do hepatitis serology. And you'll get your full marks for that spot. Yeah, yeah this is most likely viral hepatitis. And uh, you mm -hmm. get that for, for hepatitis uh, B and C, most likely B and C, and likely to be A. Could be A. You can say it for the full panel, we will not kill you if you believe out A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second one. Bit more challenging. The second one. Okay, you can go home on it. And I think that is you can. Uh, uh, Marshall has uh, quite a bit on enzymology, which is useful for your reading. Yeah, at least uh, if you have the basic for Marshall, you're good. Any question? Any question? Okay, no questions means I can uh, I can leave. Is that okay? So we can call it a day. Uh, yes, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, kindly, just uh, there's one question actually mm -hmm. to kindly repeat on serial enzyme estimation. Okay, somebody is asking about HCC. Okay, hepatocellular cancer for the yes, second one. Yes. Okay, uh, okay, sorry, I got distracted looking at the chat. What are you asking, Khan? Yes, there was that other question for serial enzyme estimation mm -hmm. on the chat. Oh, there's a question. Yes. What, how is the question uh, for, uh, so what, where is it? Or repeat on serial enzyme estimation. Okay, so serial, yes. I say that uh, a patient has uh, uh, come, you're suspecting, you're suspecting like now this uh, uh, 30 year old male with hepatitis. While the patient is in the ward, you will continue measuring the enzymes as indications of the disease progression or the effectiveness of your intervention. That is now serial, yeah. And uh, and uh, if uh, if the 
if the patient is uh, responding to the intervention, then the enzyme levels will decrease in tandem with the clinical presentation. And that is why like even in AMI, we know it would be described, you know, the diagnosis of AMI would be described as a characteristic rise and fall. You can only identify rise and fall with a serial estimation. You have a time zero, day one, day two, ETC, and you'll see the patient I mean, the enzyme levels dropping to normal. I don't know whether that is clear, Ahmed. I don't know that that is clear, Ahmed. Okay, thank you. Then uh, hepatocellular cancer. Uh, I don't know why you picked on hepatocellular. There is, uh, there is uh, evidence of cholestasis. Yeah, there is evidence of cholestasis with minimal uh, the bilirubin is not significantly elevated. So hepatocellular cancer is a differential. Yeah, hepatocellular cancer is a differential for, for that. If it was a child, we could say even very early presenting, early presentation of hepatitis. When before, before you get now hepatocellular, hepatocellular damage, because the inflammation would cause biliary uh, 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 biliary obstruction and the ALP and gamma GT would rise. So that that was a violet. That was a uh, a good one. Okay. Is there? Um, hmm. Yes, there there is. I think there is a question with regard to distinguishing salivary from pancreatic amylase. There is, and it was uh, exploited very early. But uh, once uh, lipase came on, there was now no need to, to distinguish because the distinguishing was to improve this on the specificity of amylase for, for pancre pancreatitis diagnosis. Now that we have lipase, we are not really so much concerned with the, with the distinguishing from the two. But yes, there was, but it's no longer, we, we no longer do that. That is Eugene. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think those are all the questions on the chat. Okay, so good afternoon, people. I think we can. Thank leave. you, Professor. All right. Yes. Recording stopped.